Petr Bostry from Česká spožitelná. And online we have also Faye Walsh Druyard. She's here with us. So Faye, I guess you can hear us. And say hello. Okay, great. We can see you. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will start this session by short introductions of each panelist. They will tell you more about their uh, background, uh, about the institutions they are representing, and then we will start the discussion. Uh, I will ask questions, but I have prepared some, but I will be more than happy if you will ask as well. You can join the discussion easily by using Slido. Uh, the hashtag you will see in the presentation, so... You can join us at Slido and ask a question. I will check the questions regularly on my uh, tablet, so uh, during the discussion uh, your voice can be heard. Okay, that's it, I guess, and we can start with the introductions. And let's start with Faith. so the floor is yours. Tell us more about the Wake Up Venture. Yes, thank you so much, and uh, I apologize that I cannot be there in person. Hopefully I will uh, be able to travel to the Czech Republic uh, sometime in the near future. I'm calling you from Dublin, Ireland, um, but I am actually American and based in Europe on and off for the last, oh gosh, 14 years or so. Uh, I am a recovering social entrepreneur, have always been on a mission to do good and do well. I worked in an education enterprise in California that was actually made into a feature film starring Hilary Swank. And during that process, became very passionate about the lack of impact-minded capital for founders with great ideas to solve social and environmental problems. Uh, found my way to back to Europe uh, in the Netherlands and then in Ireland, uh, and have been working with early stage founders, uh, and also have been an angel investor for the last six years, and really noticed the lack of venture funds focused on the early stage, for social and environmental innovations and companies uh, that, again, are solving some of the biggest challenges of our lifetime due to climate change and mass inequality. And that is the genesis of Wake Up Capital, which is the first early stage impact fund based in Ireland, but we also invest in Europe. Um, and I am delighted to be here to talk a bit more about the opportunity of investing in sustainable innovation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for your introduction. Um, the different perspective uh, will bring uh, Ivana, uh, she's from Milan, a small business, and she'll tell you more about their story. Yeah. So, I will maybe try to make my life uh, easier by asking a question, who among you know Mila? And where it is? Okay, so... <laughs> but it's uh, actually not, uh, not bad, uh, and there is no Mila yet in, uh, in Brno, so that might be the, the reason. But actually, MIVA is a, a Czech startup. MIVA stands for minimal waste. And uh, we have developed a system uh, of reusable packaging uh, that is um, appealing and acceptable to large uh, producers, not only, but uh, to the producers and retailers who are having the most demanding uh, standards uh, in, the, in the sector when it comes to hygiene. So we have a system we believe uh, is efficient and uh, is fulfilling the, the standards. It's based on the large reusable packaging that is inserted into refill stations in the stores, but MIVA can work also in an automated, autonomous way, so uh, for instance, in the offices. Okay, great. So we have impact venture capital, then we have the company which is combining different sources of finance, and uh, you will tell us more about it later. And there is also the uh, dimension of bank institutions. So, Peter, tell us more about Česká spořitelná. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm working for Česká spořitelná. Uh, it is one of the five biggest banks in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have strong retail, but we have also a very strong financing for companies, it is 60 percent is for retail of loans, provided loans, and 40 percent is uh, for companies. And I think that in the last year, uh, we was the biggest uh, corporate lender in the Czech Republic, uh, but it is 50-50 with commercial need the big yeah. And my job is a type lead of corporate engagement type, and I think it needs some explanation because it origins from a child way of work, which we adopted, 
and my team has three main responsibilities. The first, I client that uh, data, properly handling this data, preparing of personalized addresses for our customers, and also we are uh, we run our CRM system. Yeah. And the second responsibility is customer care. Uh, together with uh, marketing communication, direct communication, we also handling the uh, customers' complaints and uh, we are responsible for also events for the clients, uh, uh, including also some conferences about ECG and trainings and so on. And the third area uh, is about developing of new products, but not from technical point of view, uh, we can say from the bank point of view, but uh, from the point of view of customer needs. And uh, it is the very reason why uh, we are in charge of uh, preparing of concept of green advisory in Cheska. Uh, and we perceive the role of banks in this area as uh, to be some guide to help companies went through this difficult process of transformation, which is not easy for the Czech Republic because the targets of Green Deal are very ambitious and the condition in the Czech Republic is not so favorable uh, uh, because we have some weather conditions, some landscape condition and only limited possibility to build renewable sources. And we are prepared to help the companies mainly in the areas when we are very strong and it is financial advisory how to properly finance the green transformation and the second is financing and trust me we are a very good in it uh, we are doing it for uh, 200 years and that's all I think. <laughs> so you will tell us more about the product as such but let's start with a very general question but how do you from the institutional point of view define actually the sustainable innovation the type of innovation do you have some specific uh, metrics in general, it is easy. It should be everything uh, which helps company to survive for long term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, from the today's point of view, it is mainly some activity linked to ECG or to green transformation. And from our opinion and uh, what we experienced in the last year, it is mainly about uh, fulfillment of regulatory things, some legal things. The second main area is uh, about uh, saving costs in, uh, in energy area. And the last is self-sufficiency of businesses. Okay. Investment to these three areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Faye, maybe uh, Wake Up Capital, do you have uh, some specific sectors you are especially supporting or is it a bottom-up approach? Mm. So uh, we are, I would say, what you would call a more of a generalist impact fund, um, which means we're not focusing on one specific vertical or area. Uh, instead, we focus sort of on, on um, sustainability as one area and then also inclusive services. And for the purposes of today's session, I'll focus on the sustainability. Within that area, we would look at um, generally uh, B2B tech-enabled solutions uh, that help legacy industries to be more sustainable. And it's usually within food and ag, uh, food and agriculture, we look at energy uh, solutions, we look at circular economy, which could also involve waste and water, um, and sometimes in the bioeconomy as well. We're not looking at investing in, for example, a big wind farm. We might be more interested in the new technology that creates and a more efficient wind blade that you would put on a big turbine. Uh, so we do look at hardware and software, but in general, the way we would define um, you know, sustainable innovation is that you know, these industries, these value chains are making intentional shifts in the way that they produce their products or services. Uh, and the companies that we support might be as simple as a new software platform that integrates into the company's supply chain to help understand its carbon offsets, for example, or it could be um, a food packaging technology that helps minimize food waste in the production line. Um, we might also look at a wastewater management system that's using sensor and software technologies to reduce the amount of water leakage in commercial and residential buildings. And, and then we're also looking at some sort of more wild, fun ideas where we're seeing um, 
special packaging and wrap around bales of hay that's made from seaweed. So it's biodegradable and also edible for farm uh, animals. So there's quite a range of technologies that we look at, um, but we definitely usually look at the early stage. So these are often companies that are coming out of uh, potentially a university spin out. They might have been an accelerator. They've received funding, particularly in Ireland, from Enterprise Ireland, which is the main um, enterprise funder on, uh, in the country. Um, and that's kind of the, the range of areas. Just to mention in the inclusive services, there often are also, there's also an environmental component, but that's usually within sort of health and wellness, fintech, edtech, and that's for individuals and populations of people who are overlooked by modern services. We want to make them more inclusive. But as I said today, I know we're really focused on, um, on sustainability. So I hope that gives a little bit of a flavor for the kind of companies we look for. Okay, that was a very great range, <laughs> almost all sectors uh, you named. And um, maybe I will, I will... And maybe concerning sectors, uh, oh. I have some uh, statistics. The biggest part of the clients in the last two years, uh, which were concerned in the some green topic, uh, it was companies from energy sector, developers or building companies because green buildings, and transportation companies with own fleet. Uh, it is heavily, uh, these companies are, uh, should be heavily impacted by uh, regulation. And in the last year, after starting of war at Ukraine, it is also companies with uh, high energy costs, yeah, which are some, somehow aware about increasing costs and self-sufficiency, yeah, because there are some shortage in uh, okay, great. We already have some questions in Slido. Thank you for using it. Uh, so the first one, uh, Faye, is for you. What's the average wake-up capital ticket? The average, pardon, the average price of a ticket size? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I feel like that's the most, that must be an entrepreneur asking that question. Um, so we are currently um, in our, our fund own fundraising process with the European Investment Fund, who is our anchor. Um, so we'll be more operational in the beginning of 2023, but we have been actively investing for the last two years uh, and regardless. Um, our ticket size average will be about 500K. And again, this is usually C up to Series A. Uh, so 500K is around the average. Uh, we could go lower to 250K because that's often the ticket size of the um, for the Irish investments we make. That's what the uh, local government investor would do in big match funding, but it could go higher up to a Series A that maybe is a million or a two million ticket size. And again, that depends on the geography and the sector. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely does. And the second question goes to Peter. So do you work closely with Seed Starter? Yes, I am a member of Supervisory Board of Seed Starter, and I am sponsor for two uh, seed starting companies, Palma and uh, before, oh, uh, uh, thanks for that question. And I like it because it is very nice to combine big bank with SPVs. It is perfect for both sides. So uh, my question is, do companies know about... A and maybe short explanation, C-Starter is our incubator for SPVs, but uh, not typical. Uh, we are also investing to these companies and we are connecting these companies to our clients. Okay. Yeah. Do you need to do a lot of awareness raising activities in wake-up capital or in bank or do companies already know about the activities you are doing? And then I will ask Ivana, how did they actually get the funding back to the founder? I think it is... Uh, is that the question for me? Uh, yeah, for you. We can start with you, Faith. Oh, okay. Um, so, in terms of awareness building, um, I do feel like I spend a lot of time on panels like this one. <laughs> um, I think the awareness building, though, is really about the um, the focus area within sustainability, as opposed to just you know where to find startup funding. Particularly in Ireland and other countries that we've been looking at, like the Netherlands or Germany um, or the UK, there's quite a healthy startup ecosystem. But to have a very specific focus on impact, sustainable companies, I find we, we do spend quite a bit of time on ecosystem building, working with government institutions, accelerators, angel investors. Uh, for example, I'm the chair of the first impact syndicate for angel investors in Ireland, um, which had never been done before. And, uh, 
and also helping to write even papers. We're doing a report with PricewaterhouseCoopers just around you know, climate tech, uh, the state of climate tech, and then also just mapping out the investment and opportunities at the early stage. So there is a bit of ecosystem building required and also comfort given to potential investors who aren't sure how to understand, measure, or qualify investment opportunities within sustainable tech sectors. Um, it's complicated, <laughs> um, as opposed to just having to look at the business model, the market, the team. Um, you know, we're looking at another layer, which is really around whether companies can prove their impact metrics and their sustainability metrics over time. So I think that's a lot of a lot of our time is spent trying to help it and explain how we analyze companies from a sustainability perspective. And everybody's learning. Nobody's an expert. So I think we're all we're all sort of in this together, whether you're government, investor, founder, um, or ecosystem supporter. Great. Peter, what about Chess Casperizone? The question is about Česká spořitelna. Yeah. Yes, we have big focus and it is because to my salon, uh, he is very innovative and he is one of the leading person of this little tra uh, transformation of Czech economy 2.0. And one part of this letter is also sustainability. And we have uh, our long-term strategy and vision to build stronger, sustainable and more profitable Czech economy. And if you want to change something in economy, and you said economy, hey, uh, please be stronger, uh, nothing happens. Uh, and uh, you must start from the society, uh, building open society with educated people, and then help companies, because companies are economy. Yeah. Economy is nothing without companies. Uh, uh, we have deep focus, and we have big focus also for SPVs. Yeah? Uh, because for us, it is some way how to survive. To understand the species. Yeah. Uh, sorry, startups, startups. A, spe a special purpose, uh, purpose vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, startups, uh, startups, but not only technology startups. Yeah. Uh, sorry, when speaking about technology startups, uh, Ivana from Viva, you are combining different sources of uh, funding. Uh, but where did you get the information about it? Yeah, uh, actually, I just, <laughs> I just uh, realized that one of the sources of the funding, which was at the very beginning, uh, was actually a loan from Česká Spořitelna, this InnoStart <laughs> startup loan. So uh, we have actually quite a mix of the financing, but the question wasn't what kind do we have? Uh, yeah, it, it, we started with awareness raising, so how did you get information? Um, I mean from all different sources, from the community, from meeting people, uh, internet. Was uh, it easy for you? Or do you think those informations are available or do you look at specific <laughs> uh, activities, events, networking? Uh, I, was, uh, I would say that the knowledge about uh, the investors or awareness of the investors or other means was sort of like coming to us in the right time so um, <laughs> so so basically that's it so maybe just to put it in um, uh, so that you are aware of uh, what we are and we were dealing with so we have a combination at the very beginning uh, Meva was basically supported by, by the founder so Meva was lucky to have a founder who is an entrepreneur and, and had built a company before that and was able in the very beginning to support it also financially. Uh, after that, uh, the example I was citing was the InnoStar loan for, for startups and then we started uh, looking for the investors. Uh, we, uh, we were raising and actually having the discussions with investors uh, around 2019, uh, and we went really into uh, the fundraising with the beginning of actually the pandemic. <laughs> so uh, that wasn't easy either, but in the end we closed the first financing round in October 2020. And shall I continue? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> the okay. the story is much bigger actually in your case. Okay. Uh, so that was October 2020. Uh, shortly before last Christmas, so we are uh, one year after that, we finally, because
because we tried it a couple of times, succeeded in, uh, in being granted this EIC Accelerator mm -hmm. uh, grant, plus uh, we applied for the grant and investment component. So this is what was previously the Horizon 2020 SME instrument and became the EIC Accelerator. So we succeeded, uh, applied for the grant, and now the part, the investment component by the EIC fund shall be invested in the round, which is now open. So we are now back in, in, the, in the fundraising with, with this year. So actually it's quite a uh, continuous, almost never-ending process, but, but we're coping with it. Okay, maybe when speaking about EIC Accelerator, it's uh, a very specific funding scheme, uh, very depending in, term of, uh, in terms of innovativeness and product market fit. So could you maybe tell us very briefly what, what is your aim in this grant, how it will help you in the innovation of your product? Mm -hmm. so, so the grant is, um, well, the EIC Accelerator, for those that may not know about it, is a program uh, set by the European Commission that is meant to support still quite risky early stage companies, technological companies, startups that are having, and that, that's their wording, game changing uh, innovations in their, in their fields uh, that require uh, quite uh, substantial uh, capital but are at a stage where they're still too risky to be uh, fully financed by the private capital, private investors and funds on the, on the market. So they actually act to uh, de-risk and add capital and the grant is meant to finance uh, primarily the development, so it's not meant to go into business activities. And it's also um, meant for companies which are in very specific moment or particular moment of the technology development which is in their uh, terminology called TRL, Technology Readiness Level 7, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. So it's basically uh, the product uh, is um, before being uh, fully finalized and before going to full co commercialization. But it's already quite substantial and, uh, and developed. And we applied for that, we applied, I haven't mentioned in explaining what MEVA is, it's basically a combination of hardware, packaging and, and the system behind it, but uh, there is also software and digital element and we are having both of them uh, in this uh, Horizon or now EIC Accelerator Grant program which is for this year and for next year. And uh, just uh, to give you an idea, uh, the maximum grant amount and we applied for the maximum is 2.5 million euro, uh, so this is uh, from what uh, MIVA development will be further financed. So you are getting the grant component and those two and a half million euros and then you will also get the extra funding from the VC, uh, from the European Commission, right? Exactly. So it's, it's combined, so that's also quite unique in the EAC Accelerator that it's combining all those sources. Just Exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, would it help you actually preparing the proposal or, or was it by yourself or did you work with some specialist? How is it working? Because it's extremely uh, time demanding and also not everyone will succeed. The success rate is pretty low, so it's a great achievement actually. Thank you. <laughs> We're very happy uh, that, that we succeeded finally. I am happy personally because I was responsible for this project and when we were submitting it this last time, I was saying myself that is for myself also the last time I'm preparing it because it's really <laughs> it's uh, it's tough and uh, actually they changed the way how the application looks like since last year, so now it's even much more demanding. Uh, the first time we submitted, it, we did it by ourselves. We received that was under the the, the old rules. Uh, we received quite a nice score, but not at all sufficient to, to move forward. So then at some point uh, we, we realized we, we need help, external help of somebody, uh, advisors, consultants who, uh, who have uh, experience and also results and who already uh, helped other companies to succeed. 
So actually, if I'm not mistaken, the, the link was made uh, by Monica or by, uh, by Yitz, uh, <laughs> who um, uh, provided us with several uh, possible consultants, and then we uh, we chose one and started working uh, working with them. And uh, yeah, and I think it was good. Um, um, oh, sorry, good. Uh, uh, decision <laughs> that we uh, that we made it because then we finally got, got it. Okay. I, I think it was also maybe partially luck because I, I think there are really a uh, lot of lot of very good and high quality projects and companies applying for the program. So I think the decision pro process and selecting the winning uh, companies is not an easy task. Okay, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I wanted to ask also the other panelists how they uh, do help their clients to, to get the funding and maybe also it helped me with another question from the audience. It targets you, Peter. So banks are in general not overly friendly towards startups. So how difficult it is for a startup to get in touch with you and to get yes, funding uh, with you? You are true, but uh, they are not. And two reasons. The first is that the banks are not able to fully understand startups. And the second is regulation. And uh, the startups are in reality too risky for, for normal uh, bank business. Yes. But we did it two times in the history. One was in Ostart. And uh, it's nice to meet you because I started it from credit risk, uh, this program, and the second was Cheslakev, Fresh Blood. It was under uh, some, not some city, but some, well, uh, support of interest from uh, EB, yes. And now uh, we put the money aside to the seed starter and we are able to invest it to the startups and even to provide it loans to the startups. But even uh, when we want to be friendly, we can kill startup uh, because maybe to connect application to the bank, to the big bank, should kill some startup yeah? with three uh, IT guys or something. And it is not different for startups in uh, sustainability. It is the same problem. And the biggest problem uh, which we solve now is not with technology startups uh, because there are a lot of other support in the market, but for we call it new to market entrepreneurs uh, because nobody cares of carpenters or hairdressers or uh, these people and, and nobody is able to uh, lend some money for them without two years history and it is very difficult. And Faye, uh, what about the makeup capital? So, how long is the process, and how do you support startups uh, in, in the process to get the funding? Um, so, maybe I'll start with the second question first: is how we support startups. Um, most of us in the our team um, already are engaged in the startup community. Um, you know where we work, either in Ireland, UK, or elsewhere. So we are constantly meeting startups and providing support, whether we're panels on panels or judges for funding applications. So, for example, we all have done some work with Enterprise Ireland or other funder groups that have competitive um, applications. Sometimes we are brought in as as reviewers, and that's often really helpful, especially if we meet the companies after the process is closed. We can give feedback on the application. Um, and we also spend time with founders before we would even consider investing. Sometimes that, that can be over months and months and months or a year because we like to meet founders early uh, to get a sense of who they are and develop a relationship with them. So what we've done with certain companies is maybe we pick every six months, we pick four or five, and we try to meet with them every month and come up with one or two challenges that we can help work through with them, and they find that really helpful, and it gives us a chance to get to know them before we invest. So it's not a formal accelerator, but it's definitely a nice way to have a continuous conversation. Uh, I think uh, we're very empathetic to founders. We've all started businesses, closed some of them. Uh, so we know the time spent with an investor who might not invest can sometimes feel like a drain, and we try to make any meeting that we have have a value add 
Of course, the other thing we do is networking and making connections. So if we see opportunities with either other funders, other angel investors, banks, or, or programs we're aware of, or accelerators, we make introductions as often as we can. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm a matchmaker in that regard. Um, and I think that can be really helpful. And um, we have also, with regard to um, the program you were just speaking about, the EIC, sometimes um, they need letters, companies need letters of support from potential investors, and we're, we've written, I don't know, many of those at this stage. Uh, and I think all, all that kind of support, even before the fundraising comes in the door, can be really helpful. Uh, and that gives us a sense when we're doing our due diligence of, of how they operate and how they work. Uh, in terms of our process, I'd say, you know, due diligence could take anywhere from, you know, two to three months to, to longer, and it depends on, it's all about timing. So when does the fund, when does the company want to close its round? Um, I'd, but I'd say on average, it's three to six months. It just really depends on when we meet them. When, when do they start opening the round, you know, and then when are they trying to close? Um, I think also with our experience as Angel, we don't, we don't want to drag on the process. It can be really challenging and difficult to raise money. We want those companies to raise as much money as they can. Um, maybe not too, in too short a process, but enough time to do an adequate due diligence. And I guess the other thing we do is get to know the other investors who are going to come into a deal. And can we kind of piggyback on their DD or share some of our findings? We try to be collaborative. That's not always the way with VCs, um, but we find with um, impact-minded VCs, there's a little bit more of cooperation and collaboration around the table um, because we're all on a mission to not just um, have the company be a commercial success, but we're really passionate about the actual social environmental impact that comes out alongside of it. Okay, thank you. We have another question from the audience, the burning one actually, because it's questioning the panel as such. Is there a need to discuss funding of sustainability as if such projects were different? What trade-offs they must do that change perception of their value? So who would love to start? For us, it is quite a similar process as other financing. Uh, and the other differences are uh, we are using different tools and we are using our expert for sustainability or subsidies. But it is still about project, about cash flow, and there is in reality no modification for the project now in funding. But because the companies which are interested to digitalization and to gain transformation are lower scale, uh, in the end uh, there are better access to money and also a more favorable price. But the, but the process is the same as for other investment. Maybe I, I will follow up because as just as Pojitana, you declared that you will fund or finance uh, the green projects. So what is your motivation actually to, to declare this? Maybe this is also the part of the question. Our motivation in our mission to build the sustainable, or stronger, and more profitable economy. And also, we have some strong social responsibility because heating system in the Czech Republic is based on coal, and we want to support also the society and not harming the living standards, maybe. And to be fair, uh, we are still some uh, private company and we want to be successful too and uh, we really strongly believe that we will improve the Czech economy, we will improve also our business. Uh, you also declared you have some green metrics for, for finance and sustainability, but could you maybe tell us yeah, more yeah, about there this? is a lot of metrics and a lot of uh, directives and regulations. Yeah. Uh, G A R G E R and and others, yeah. But uh, I can say there are uh, three main kind of sustainability loans. Uh, one are activity linked. It is uh, and I should say it is direct financing of some green projects as photovoltaic plant, of improving of uh, building energy efficiency. And there are some uh, behavioral linked projects. It, it is uh, normal loan, general loans, maybe some investment frame, but with condition or KPIs uh, which somehow measure 
the transition of a company to be green, and these loans are not today green from point of view, uh, uh, point of view of regulators. Yeah, and the last group of loans are uh, it is taxonomy allied, and it is uh, how to say <laughs> simply: if the company is green, everything loaned loan to this company is green. And it is now on the edge of regulatory to be green or not to be green. Yeah. But today it is only this direct investments and especially in area of real estate, uh, energy and transportation. Mm -hmm. And regulatory regulation is not valid for the biggest companies. But I think the SMEs and small businesses or micros will follow in the next five years. Okay, uh, maybe also this targets you, so what was your motivation in Data for Capital to support specifically sustainable project? Or is there a need to discuss those uh, sustainability funding as such? Is it fun? It's normal funding or do you see there? Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, my motivation is obviously to try to solve some of these biggest challenges, but I, I won't go on and on about, uh, about that. I think we're all aware of, of the, the challenges we're facing as a planet. Uh, in terms of what we, I think we're talking a bit about sort of impact metrics and, um, and what, we, what we would look for from companies and what we think is coming down the pike for companies um, and also funds. So the recent, the regulatory pressures on um, any fund that says it's sustainable, um, is, especially in Europe, you know, we're going to be dealing with um, SFDR, which is all around transparency. So any fund that does say it's sustainable is going to have to prove um, that it is by disclosing its own uh, metrics around, um, you know, environmental um, targets. And that in turn is going to impact any um, holdings that they have as a funder. So if you're a VC that wasn't, in a, you know, labeling yourself as a <clears throat> sustainability VC and all of a sudden you've told everyone you are, well, you're gonna have a really hard time proving that if you haven't got your portfolio companies to understand their own metrics on performance, whether around carbon, uh, et cetera. So uh, we actually welcome the regulations. I know they can make life very difficult for certain industries, but I think if we don't have those, we won't be able to understand who's actually driving the, 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 the environmental change and shift that we need in some of these legacy industries. And of course, at the larger companies already have to do disclosures, um, but like the gentleman who said before me, you know, these are already in place and they're probably going to affect early stage companies. The other reason we find this super important is that some of the customers that these companies are dealing with, let's pretend they're in sort of fashion or food or agriculture, they are also becoming much more, um, the, the, there's much more demand for the, those companies to make disclosures around their own performance. And so if they're going to bring on a, a new service or product into their supply chain, they're going to have to look and do the, their own sort of ESG sweep or sustainability um, uh, evaluation of any, any new products and services because that's going to obviously affect uh, their own performance as a company. Now, I still think we're in the early days of how it's really going to impact, say, public, publicly traded company performance and share price. Um, but again, I, I really have a dream and vision that we have impact on the balance sheet so that any new company starting up really has to think through their ESG policies, um, but also can be very, has to be very specific if they are an innovation that claims to be sustainable, understanding the three to five sustainability KPIs that you measure on and you report on, how are you able to actually get that data and how, how do you link it to your financial performance? Some companies we see come to us and they say, well, we've just planted a bunch of trees, but we're helping to basically sell coal over here, whatever it is. That doesn't, that doesn't, we're not interested in that. We're interested in the solutions that are actually going to evolve some of these industries to be measurably more um, sustainable over time. And that's hard to do. Uh, but I think we do have to set out and hold standards very high, otherwise we will be seeing lots of, of greenwashing. So the regulations are welcome in a, to a certain extent, but they are making extra work um, for, for companies. And I think what we try to do as a fund is to help think through those regulations and how, which ones are going to be the most impactful for a business uh, and, and help simplify it for, especially the early stage when you're really just trying to bring in revenues and raise money or get the right team in place. How can you be really careful and thoughtful at the early days of your ESG policy, but also identifying those key impact metrics that you think you can measure on over time? You'll attract more money, you'll attract more customers, 
more employees, you'll probably get better government funding, uh, and I think overall your performance uh, will, will be better. I think a great example of a company we could celebrate today would be Patagonia, who has had excellent uh, criteria both environmentally and socially. Of course, they're much larger, but it, they're a good example of uh, how, when you do it right, it really works. Yeah, thank you for using this uh, amazing example of Patagonia. Peter, you would like uh, to follow up? Only a short amendment. We are under, uh, also under strong regulation. Uh, we have to uh, compute the green rating for each company and uh, we have to fulfill some uh, green assets ratio till uh, 2027, yes. And I have some short survey, but uh, some five months old, uh, which the companies told us what uh, their reason to be green or to ask for some uh, green investments. And the first reason is legal. The second is supply, uh, supply chain. Uh, su uh, sorry, a supply chain. It is very common for SMEs typically that uh, they are under pressure of their customers, uh, especially some big automotive company or some uh, bigger company. And this, uh, the third reason is uh, responsibility to planet. Uh, and uh, the next reason is saving costs, mm -hmm. and then investors, and then clients, oh. customers. Thank you for sharing this survey. So it's very useful, and I believe this has answered the question from the audience. Ivana, maybe also from your perspective of small uh, uh, enterprise, uh, have you been um, like a did you get some extra points for being sustainable when applying for grants, loans, uh, or, or VC funding? So for uh, startups, uh, when I look at the investors at the, uh, at the funds, uh, there will be funds who already in, in the name or in uh, their naming would put an, an impact investment fund. So there's a group, uh, and actually we're having uh, Telia Impact Ventures, the first uh, Czech impact fund uh, who uh, invested in the in, in our first uh, first round. This segment is much much bigger and much much older in uh, uh, in the Western Europe, for instance, where those funds has been have been uh, existing for more than thirty years. So um, so then those funds will. Um, <coughs> On purpose, be looking for um, for investees uh, that are making uh, impact, being it uh, social, so social, social into society <laughs> impact, <laughs> or uh, or environmental uh, impact, uh, and then there will be the funds uh, who are not necessarily investing in sustainability, but maybe they're having. Uh, more like segment uh, segmentation of where, where they're going, and uh, and I wanted to say something else. And then for sure, for instance, the EIC accelerator bringing it back. Uh, we applied uh, under one part of it, which is the Green Deal part. So, uh, so specifically, uh, there are companies being supported in this in this segment. So in 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 the grant schemes, it's coming. Uh, Nowadays, naturally, quite often, that those kind of companies are uh, are supported. Yeah. Okay. So, so for us, as we are uh, both impactful company, but also like a changer of the packaging uh, industry, we we find uh, valid both both types of uh, investors or eventually other sources of financing for us. So thank you for sharing also your perspective. We have another question from the audience, which is, do you see sustainability-focused startups as a less risky investment? How do they compare to the rest? Maybe Faye, if you can start. Um, well, all startups are risky, so <laughs> whether they're sustainable or not is a good percentage of them that are not going to make it. Unfortunately, that's just the way that it goes. Um, you know, it's a really good question, actually. I'd say a few years ago, um, maybe even before COVID, um, when those of us who are focused on impact and sustainability have felt like sort of outliers, um, I'd say it was more risky because uh, mainstream markets weren't really paying as much attention to this as they are now. And that just added another level of risk because we weren't sure that the market was moving in the right direction. 
Today, I would say maybe that risk has been mitigated to a certain extent because there's much more emphasis put on sustainability, um, green innovation, and, and just the, the drive and all those um, levers we spoke about earlier. On the other hand, it doesn't entirely remove the risk um, uh, that these companies could fail. And a lot of that also has to do with some of the, the work and that has to be done by these technologies. I'd say, you know, 75% of these companies are going to be just evolutionary technologies helping these existing legacy industries to tweak and change the way that they operate. And then we're going to need about 25% of these technologies to be absolutely revolutionary and change the way that we live our everyday lives. Um, and, and, and some of them are real deep technology solutions. Um, you know, if it's, for example, cell-based meat or coming up with the most incredible, you know, battery that can store all the energy we need for our homes. Uh, that's that's going to require patient and risk capital and time. And I think what's happening now is we're feeling the pressure because the planet is telling us uh, that we need to get on with it. And so hopefully bringing larger scale checks and funders into the, this space can help de-risk some of the projects uh, and, and help them get to market faster or help them fail faster. As I said, it's okay that they fail, but we need to find out if they're going to fail a bit faster and really focus on the ones that we think are going to work. So I guess the answer is um, just as risky as any other startup, maybe an added level of risk because we're doing a lot of different new revolutionary things. Um, but, but um, you know, the risk is worth taking. Okay, so it's extra risky. Another part of the question is how do you support women entrepreneurs doing some special ah. scheme for them? Okay, I'm going to take that one quickly because um, I'm very passionate about it. Uh, one of the reasons why I actually started a fund from scratch, which by the way is not the easiest thing to do in the world, so I don't recommend it to everyone, um, is because of the lack of female fund managers in the investment world. It is absolutely appalling and the numbers have not significantly increased recently, unfortunately. And there are a myriad of reasons why that is the case. But the reason why that's a problem for female entrepreneurs is because, as we all know, when you have a female um, fund manager, you're an investor, you're often two times as likely to back a female founder, and you're three times as likely to back a female CEO. So if you have a small number of female investors at the decision-making table, the chances for female founders to actually receive startup capital and investment capital goes down. Um, and that is the reality. So I think having a purpose-built fund that has a female, at least one female GP, doesn't have to be everyone, I think is, 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 is an imperative. That's part of why we, we are built the way that we are. Um, I think it's also important to spend extra time reaching out to female founders um, and providing support when needed when it comes to um, asking for money and doing some things that sometimes are counterintuitive uh, to the way that we were raised as girls and women. Um, the reality is many of us were not ever told we could be an entrepreneur or an investor. So some of the messages um, we received didn't sort of set us up for the best success, but doesn't mean we don't have the capacity or ability. So I think um, I read in the report about Czech startup um, uh, landscape from 2019 to 2020 that maybe 5% of founders are women, and I could be wrong, but that's what I read. Um, that's, that's too bad. <laughs> we need to fix that. Um, there, there's proof um, that diverse teams outperform, diverse companies outperform. And so I guess one of the things we do as a fund is no matter where this company is in terms of stage, even if it's not a perfect fit for us, we always make time for female founders and also founders of diverse backgrounds and diverse abilities, um, which I think is absolutely important. Give, give everyone a chance to compete. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for sharing also these activities and thank, thank you uh, also for this uh, amazing question. I would maybe add that also European Commission is specifically supporting women entrepreneurs by various uh, grant schemes like Women in Tech, for example. So uh, this is also a very nice activity which is maybe more on the social than environmental part of the sustainable goals. However, we are coming to the end of this session. There's no more uh, room for uh, another question. Uh, so thank you all panelists for sharing your insights, for answering the questions, the audience for asking those great questions. Uh, we will continue, there's no coffee break. So uh, we will go to, down to the plenary session and you can still vote for, for the best pitching, the pitching contest. So thank you all for coming, uh, for sharing your know-how. I firmly believe that uh, you will leave this room with a message that uh, 
support of sustainability is worth, that there are some funding opportunities for your business, uh, even in uh, sustainable product or services, or in transition towards more sustainable product or service. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you.